my pleasure now to introduce and welcome to the Wings Club today's guest speaker, Brad Tilden. Brad is chairman and chief executive officer of Alaska Air Group, which includes its subsidiaries, Alaska Airlines and Horizon Air. Now, Alaska, I think as most of you know, is noted for its award-winning customer service. The airline has earned recognition for ranking highest in customer satisfaction among North American carriers by J.D. Powers for nine consecutive years. <laughs> From a satisfied customer over there, I think. The airline has received honors for philanthropy, community service, and environmental stewardship. At the same time, Alaska Air consistently ranks among the nation's most profitable airlines. And of course, Alaska recently announced its intention to merge with Virgin America, and we probably will hear something from Brad about that. Brad is a 25-year veteran of Alaska Air Group and has received many recognitions in his own right. In 2015, Brad was listed among the top 50 corporate leaders in America by Fortune magazine, and he was also recognized by the Puget Sound Business Journal as Executive of the Year. Brad chairs the board of the Washington Roundtable and he serves on the boards of the Boy Scouts of America, Pacific Lutheran University, and Nordstrom, which I find of particular interest. <laughs> a true aviator, Brad also holds a pilot's license with an instrument rating. And I also want to note that Brad and Alaska Airlines uh, are providing free air travel to those immediate family members affected by the tragedy in Orlando. So another testament to Alaska's uh, community service. Please join me in welcoming Brad Tilden. Thanks very much, Mary. It is a real honor to be here and uh, spend a little bit of time with all of you guys. It's uh, fun to see so many uh, friendly faces in the room from other airlines and manufacturers, uh, terrific friends from Seattle. We appreciate all of you uh, being out here to be with us. And uh, whether you're from Seattle or New York or uh, whatever part of our country, all of our hearts do go out to the uh, folks affected by the shootings in Orlando. It's, uh, we're, our thoughts and prayers are with those people. Um, I am excited to talk to you today about the industry and the, the way we see it, and, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to launch into this and share, share some of uh, our views. So the late uh, and the great and the greatest Muhammad Ali was a pretty smart guy. He was known, of course, worldwide for his uh, poetic predictions, his witticisms, and in those uh, cocky quips, the, we sometimes heard the truth. When he was asked to tell a joke, he said, jokes, there are no jokes. The truth is the funniest joke of all. I think he might have been talking about our business, the, the, air, the airline business. Today, there's an escalating difference of opinion about what is true for our business. And when I hear some of these opinions, I'm sometimes tempted to respond, you must be joking. Two competing and polarizing views are emerging. These conflicting views can be summed up, they can be easily described. On many, many fronts, we're choosing between yesterday and between tomorrow. There are those who would return us to yesterday. This retreat takes the form of four myths about this industry. And I'd like to talk about each one of these four myths. The first myth is the things used to be better myth. Some lament that flight experiences today just aren't cutting it. People would say the good old days before deregulation were better than today. Let's consider this. Some of you aren't old enough. I see some over here, maybe. But does anyone here actually remember how it was back then? Passengers in their Sunday best, sweepingly spacious cabins, full course meal service with Chateaubriand or lobster. Of course, passengers were fairly homogenous. They were mainly rich and mainly white. The experience got even livelier in the 70s. Spiral staircases, piano bars, lounges, uh, tiger-striped walls, lots of sideburns. <laughs> There's plenty of room on the airplane. The Civil Aeronautics Board guaranteed airlines a 12% return if we kept our load factor at 55%. And what could be more glamorous than lounging in clouds of cigarette smoke, cigar plumes, and pipe fumes, not to mention the free scotch? Everything was high-end, especially the fare. Tickets cost a fortune. Supreme Court uh, Justice Stephen Breyer, an original champion of deregulation, 
noted in 2011 that the cheapest round-trip airfare in inflation-adjusted dollars between New York and L.A. in 1974 was $1,442. Some folks in the room know today that fare is less than $300, the cheapest uh, round-trip in that market. So for most Americans, the magic of flight is something they witness from the ground. Growing up in my own middle class family, I remember only one trip where we traveled together on, on an airplane. My dad was an engineer for Boeing. Every so often he had the chance to fly on business. My mom and us six kids would be awestruck when, uh, when an occasion like this arose. My dad would tell us at dinner that, you know, Boeing was going to be sending him uh, somewhere. And I remember just being so proud of my dad that Boeing thought so much of him that they were going to send him on a trip. And, uh, and the ticket would arrive, and he'd put it on his dresser, kind of like a little statue. And I remember sneaking in there to look at the statue. I was really impressed. And uh, the red carbon backing on it wasn't the only reason that I was impressed. So anyway, I understand the nostalgia to a point. But the so-called golden age of flying was more fool's gold than anything else. Air travel was exorbitantly expensive, highly elitist, much less safe than it is today. But if you believe that things used to be better, let's go to myth number two. And that's that it's time to hit the reset button. Those pining for the old days often claim that deregulation has failed. They believe that flight was better when it was regulated. They actually want us to return there. Deregulation was anything but a failure. It opened the doors to air travel for all Americans, and it democratized the flight experience. It dramatically reduced the average cost of an airplane ticket. In 1980, the average air, uh, domestic airfare was round trip was $643. Today, it's $364. Prior to deregulation, most people couldn't afford to fly. In 1971, less than half of Americans had ever traveled by air. Today, that figures 81%. With cheaper airfares, more lower income Americans are flying. For households with uh, annual incomes below $20,000, for example, the percentage of people that has flown has, ju has jumped from 18% in 1997 to 32% today. And there are corresponding increases in all income brackets below $60,000. And the democratization of flight has made flying more inclusive. Ipsos Public Affairs conducted an extensive survey last December, which was commissioned by Airlines for America. The survey found that people who fly correspond very closely to the demographic, demographics of our country as a whole representing all ages, races, and ethnicities. This is obviously unlike the regulated golden era. Deregulation brought healthy competition and growth to our industry. To make this point, two words come to mind, and I don't think they're here today. Southwest Airlines. Many other airlines, Alaska included, realized success and growth that was impossible in the regulated environment. Innovative business models have been free to develop. Carriers have adapted to compete and survive. And while it may not be easy to start an airline, it's not easy to start any business, it's still possible. You can't say that about the regulated era. As fares have dropped, traffic has increased, more than doubling since 1985. Just compare the half-empty airplanes of the pre-deregulation era to, the to today's load factors, which are in the low to mid-80s. Lower fares have enabled the industry to become more productive as a significant engine of commerce. We are truly the internet of the air, connecting people and goods, driving 5% of our nation's GDP. And this has no scientific backing, backing, but if you think about businesses that depend on us to see customers or suppliers, to attend conferences and so forth, I think our impact on the economy is much, much more than 5%. Today's lower fares make it easier for businesses to stay connected and for all of us to visit friends and relatives. Before deregulation, the industry was insanely bureaucratic. Between 1965 and 1978, the CAB approved fewer than 10% of airline applications for new routes. Delays were common. Continental, for example, had to wait eight years for approval to fly one route from San Diego to Denver. Now, Alaska's added 90 routes in the last five years. What if we had delays like that today? And to give some more perspective, U.S. airlines will fly to 24 new cities this year, 24 new cities that didn't have service last year. But some people want to start re-regulating the industry. 
We're seeing attempts to re-regulate in proposals about baggage fees, change fees, and parts of the onboard experience. What's missing from any of these proposals is a consideration of the bigger picture. Ancillary fees and other changes have evolved, such as basic economy, are, are, are happening to reduce the cost of air transportation for folks that don't want these services. We've essentially unbundled our services and given our customers the ability to pay to choose whatever features and services they desire. And customers prefer this approach. The comprehensive IPSO survey I mentioned found that 80% of flyers are either somewhat satisfied or very, very, very satisfied with their travel experiences today. Just 5% were somewhat dissatisfied, only 1% are very dissatisfied. And other observers conf uh, confirmed these findings. The American Consumer Satisfaction Index recently found uh, customer satisfaction ratings tied for their all-time high. And J.D. JD Power affirmed that the folks at JetBlue are very familiar with, uh, in Alaska as well, uh, also concluded that passenger satisfaction with North American Airlines reached a 10-year high this past year. And I do want to uh, especially call out the JetBlue folks. Alaska is very proud to win the J.D. Power recognition for network airlines or for traditional hub and, hub and spoke airlines. JetBlue folks should be very proud to win that award for the low cost uh, category. So uh, hats off to you guys. Uh, according to the EPSO survey, 86% of those that flew last year cited the total travel price as the most important factor when deciding to fly. Re-regulation crusaders also forget that passengers have choices. For instance, if they don't want to pay bag fees, they can choose airline business models or get affinity credit cards to avoid the fees. Extra legroom can be purchased in first class or in the, in the front of the main cabin at many airlines. Re-regulation efforts are typically touted as protecting consumers. But since re-regulation would unravel the low fares that make flight possible for so many, it's hard to see how this would be the case. And consider the massive effort required to put commercial aviation back into the hands of government. These people have full plates today, and many of them recognize the power of the free market to give consumers the most choices and the best prices. Those who want to hit the reset button and return to yesterday are also stubbornly refusing to let go of, of the past in another critical area, which brings us to myth number three. And that is that air traffic control reform belongs in a holding pattern. I don't know how many of you had a chance to hear Doug Parker, American Airlines CEO, speak at the, US Chamber of, at the recent U.S. Chamber of Commerce Aviation Summit. He made a fantastic case for the fundamental structural reform of our ATC system. While this system remains exceptionally safe, and while the controllers who operate it do a terrific job, it's still reliant on World War II processes and technologies. Passengers lose $17 billion each year in delays, cancellations, and misconnections, adding up to $30 billion in losses to the economy. We all know that our ATC system should incorporate the latest satellite-based satellite -based navigation and data communication, and it should meet the most advanced standards. Like most of you, I share Doug's conviction that we should remove air traffic control from the federal government's operating and funding constraints and create a not-for-profit entity with a public policy mandate and let the system users, and to be clear, by that I mean the airlines, pay for it. The concept is supported by the FAA's past three chief operating officers. It's supported by the Controllers Union, the Air Traffic Controllers Union, NATCA. It's su supported by nearly all airlines and by political leaders from both sides of the aisle. The approach is, in fact, the standard in other advanced industrial economies. We have a safe and reliable system today, but we need to make sure we keep pace with the rest of the world and head to tomorrow. Now is the time for us to move from greatest generation technology to next generation technology. In spite of the progress made in the post deregulation era, we still hear about how bad and unstable our industry is. And that leads us to myth number four, which is that things are lousy today. We're all painfully aware that the opening decade of this century was disastrous in our industry. Many of us lived it. IATA assessed the period in a 2011 report stating that 9-11 was the beginning of the most challenging decade in aviation history. The, fan the financial fallout of 9-11 was devastating for U.S. Airlines. 
revenues dropped from $130 billion in the year 2000 to $107 billion in 2002. Losses of nearly $20 billion were reported in 2001 and 2002, and between 01 and 05, losses were almost $58 billion. You get a little number, but these are big numbers. We were rounded, uh, rebounded with a $26 billion profit for 2006 and 2007, but then more disaster struck with the financial crisis and soaring oil prices, and we lost uh, another $26 billion in 2008 and 2009. The decade was terrible for customers, for employees, for communities, and investors. Customer service suffered, schedule problems and delays spiked, baggage mishandling problems occurred, flights were overbooked, too many passengers got bumped. Some of these things happened at Alaska, some of these things happened at other airlines. And our people, who we depend on to operate our company safely and reliably and to provide great customer service, were severely impacted. 160,000 jobs were lost. Pension promises were defaulted upon as airlines went through the bankruptcy process. And for investors, we've got a couple of analysts in the room, airlines were a terrible bet. Every legacy carrier except Alaska declared bankruptcy. Many smaller airlines also filed, filed for bankruptcy or just went out of business. And we're suffering from this hangover today. Customers don't know what to expect. Employees are feeling better, but are probably not 100% confident about the future. And investors don't know if things are just temporarily better or if there is a basis to fundamentally feel more optimistic about the future of our industry. Here's my point. That was then, and this is now. As we'll see in a moment, we're in good shape as an industry and getting stronger. Consolidation and improvements in airline cost structures have made us a better industry. We should always remember what can and will happen if we're not diligent managers and leaders. But we shouldn't keep wallowing in the hangover of darker times. The four myths I've described are one direction our industry can go. We can retreat to yesterday. We can cling to a fictitious memory of the good old days. We can repudiate deregulation's many democratizing achievements and re-regulate. And we can either spurn ATC reform or stand by while nothing happens. Or we can seize the progress of the last five years and charge ahead. Let's charge ahead. Let's turn our attention to the future and consider our flight path for tomorrow. Today, air travel is in a very dynamic phase. Flight has never been more affordable or accessible. Air traffic is increasing at a healthy rate and is, is expected to reach record levels this summer. Customer, customer satisfaction is currently at unprecedented levels and it continues to improve. And we offer the lowest airfares in our industry's history. We brought our on-time performance up from 72% in 2000 to 80% today. Some airlines are much higher than that. And we're giving travelers the choices they want. And we continue to find new ways to improve the in-flight experience. We're investing substantially in our communities through relief efforts, donating miles, fantasy flights, volunteer opportunities, you name it. And we're, coming, we're becoming better stewards of the environment. Together with manufacturers, between 78 and 2014, U.S. airlines improved fuel efficiency by over 120%. That's carbon dioxide savings of 3.8 me billion metric tons. Airplanes are quieter and cleaner, and we're working on biofuel alter alternatives. Just last week, Two Alaska jets left Seattle fueled by the first alcohol to jet fuel made with U.S. corn. Air travel is greener and safer than at any time in our history. And our employees are in a much better situation too. We've recovered 25,000 jobs since 2010, and our industry is pumping $3.5 billion in wages and benefits into the U.S. economy every single month. Airline worker compensation is 68% above the U.S. Uh, pr uh, private sector average. The average U.S. airline employees compensation for 2015 was $108,000, an all-time high. We're creating more new jobs and stable careers every day. And airlines are doing well, and that's good news for our investors. From 2011 to 2015, the pre-tax margin for airlines was 5%. Today, 2015, airlines produced a pre-tax margin of 14.6%, and that compares to 14% for companies in the S&P 500. Like some people in the room, I'm a bean counter. 
and I care passionately about the numbers. We had a great year at Alaska in 2015. I'm proud that our, mar our pre-tax margin was above 20 percent and better than all but 20 companies in the S&P 500. I share this because I believe, and the rest of the leadership team at Alaska believes, that airlines can, can perform as well as any other kind of business. When pre-tax margins, ROIC, and other financial metrics put us solidly in the top 10 percent of the S&P 500, we should be viewed as more than an airline trading vehicle. We should be viewed as a high quality industrial company. Airline stocks should be long term investments that you'd be happy to put your parents or your kids for that matter into. Equally important, we're investing in our product. Since 2009, the industry has put more than half its cash flow right back into the product. U.S. domestic airlines reinvest six, re, reinvested $65 billion during that time. The outlays of $17 billion last year were the highest in the last 16 years. To the folks in this room that produced those things that we bought, you're welcome. That's, I was hoping for a laugh. That's uh, $22 per passenger per flight. The bulk of that investment was in new planes. Last year, on average, the U.S. industry took delivery of one new airplane every day. At Alaska, we announced we're purchasing 30, 30 Embraer E-175 regional jets for Horizon Air last year, an investment with a list value of $2.8 billion. We're also acquiring Virgin America. Unfortunately, Robin Hayes is not here today, <laughs> but Dave Barger is. Both are very good friends of mine. Uh, both of you guys work together to run a fantastic airline. I've got a message for you guys to deliver to Robin. I understand he's looking forward to a very relaxing summer, while well, we're not, and uh, I want to thank him for being such a skilled negotiator and ensuring that we paid top dollar for Virgin America. <laughs> so please, I'll, I'll see him at 6 o'clock tonight, so uh, make sure he gets that before then. So invariably, some will say things are great now, but isn't this just the peak of the cycle? Isn't this what it feels like at the peak of the cycle? And to be fair, that's possible. But I would submit that we're learning to manage cyclicality. We're learning to control the things that we can control. I believe we're on a long-term path in our post-deregulation evolution. We've adapted over time, and the cycles are more boom and less bust. We're learning and maturing. That, ta that takes time, but we should all like where we're headed. If cycles last, say, 10 years, We've completed three now since deregulation. We're in good shape. Imagine what things will be like after we've completed four or five cycles. But we should ask ourselves what role cycles actually play. The New York, New York Times ran an article in 2008 in which Mo Garfinkel, a longtime industry consultant, talked about the post-deregulation world. He said, this is the free market at work, and we're not used to it. And he expressed the view that the industry was just winding up the first phase of deregulation in which industry practices were being established. We all know we'll continue to learn and evolve. We have a common interest in healthy competition and mutual success. As I move towards the conclusion of my prepared remarks, I'd like to share a few key principles that we're using at Alaska that I believe will help keep us strong and healthy. The first is something we call high performance culture. We're asking our leaders to look outside the industry at the best operators, the people who provide the best customer service, the best financial managers, and then we ask them to match those best practices. Is that an unreasonable standard for an airline? You might say yes, but that's what we believe we must do, and we need to do this with urgency. The second principle we call devoted to our customers. If we're to be honest, Customers were not our first priority during what I might call our darkest decade. But here's the thing. They're the only people who pay us to do what we do and come back the next day to a job that we love. We need to listen to them closely. We need to build our product and services around them and their desires. We need to fully address their needs. The third principle we call committed to our employees, our people. Too many of our employees were on the receiving end of the necessary pain and consolidation of cost restructuring. This resulted in people who were unaligned, unmotivated, unengaged. This is understandable. We now need to fully engage them, earn back their trust, 
and work together to make the air travel experience the best that it can be. This is the best thing, not only for them, but for everybody who depends on this system. And finally, we need to continue to build culture, a culture where leaders deliver results. That means we lead, we measure, we manage, and we execute. It's, it's exciting to be on a promising path, but we cannot let up. We must stay focused on all of our constituents, customers, communities, employees, and investors. If we lose sight of any of these groups, they all suffer. And like any other business, we must continue to achieve strong financial results and earn the ongoing faith of the investment community. We're on a flight path to sustained industry health, progress, and prosperity. I ask you to join me in believing in this progress in spite of the naysayers. As I thought about what to say today, my mind kept coming back to Alfred Kahn. As you know, Kahn was a leading scholar on deregulation and the driving force behind airline deregulation. I can't help but wonder, what would Alfred Kahn think about today's air travel industry? And I think he'd be pleased. I think he'd be proud of where we are today. He wanted more people to fly. He wanted the industry to live up to its great free market potential as an economic engine. Kahn understood back then what most of us know now. The real magic of flight is the way it connects people, businesses, cultures, and commerce. And today that magic is shared by more people than ever before. It's affordable and accessible beyond what anyone would have ever dreamed about in the age of regulation. Anyone, that is, except Alfred Kahn. Khan believed in the power of air travel to shape the future. He led deregulation because he believed in tomorrow. So do I, and I'm guessing so do you. We believe in and choose tomorrow, not yesterday. All of us at Alaska and throughout the industry look forward to working together to shape what I think will be a very bright future for our industry. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. If, if folks have questions, I would love to have a little bit of a conversation and see what's on your mind. We have time for a couple. Jamie Baker, Wall Street analyst. I asked Jamie, I told Jamie what I was going to talk about today. I said, Jamie, am I on solid ground? And he said, I think so. Uh, question for you that's merger related. So in the case of Delta and Northwest, I don't think there was any unique consideration that needed to be given to the the, the passenger base yeah. that each airline brought yeah. to the franchise. Have you looked at any mergers yeah. outside of the Correct. industry for best practices yeah. in terms of, of putting yeah. two distinct brands together? Yeah. It's a terrific question, and it is the, the thing that I am losing the most sleep over with our merger, but I, th I think Jamie is actually going to where our minds are going. If, if we look at, I mean, and mate, for those that follow it a little less well, uh, Virgin and Alaska, we think, are two fantastic companies. Both operate well. Both have an incredible focus on customers. But the brands are a, a little bit different, and there is a huge loyalty to both brands. In Alaska, we fly to four countries. We fly to 35 states. But really, we have an incredible base, very large market shares for originating business in Washington, Oregon, and the state of Alaska. Virgin America has a big base of originating business in California and, to some extent, New York. So the question is, how do we bring these together and not only uh, hang on to all of the revenue and all the value that's there today, but have a platform for growth in the future? So Jamie, I think you are, you are right. If you look at the models in Europe, you see that when uh, mergers have happened, they keep brands, they keep, they keep both brands. Air France KLM would be an example. What's happening with British Airways it would be another example. Uh, Lufthansa, another as a fam family of brands in that company. So I, I, we're not ready to say anything at this point in time, but I would just say that we are looking at that because we do believe in the power of the Virgin America brand and we don't want to lose all of that loyalty and all of that revenue that exists today. So it's, it's a good question. Yeah. Time for one more. Do we have one over there? Hey, Brad, uh, Joe Thenardi from Stiefel. Um, you talked about pre-tax margins last year and maybe being the peak. Yeah. I understand no two recessions are the same, but I think if FedEx and UPS were up there, they may be able to talk about what a trough margin looked like. So can you talk about when you stress test your models, what does a trough model look like, trough margin look like for you guys? Yeah. 
You know, um, so I'll just tell you more the way we think about this, and I probably won't give you a, a quantified answer, but um, I, I do, everything I just shared about the industry, I do believe. I've been in it for 25 years. I watched it before that. I do think that we're getting better. I think this high is, is better than other highs, and I think the troughs, we have much stronger balance sheets. We have better cost structures. We have a better operations. I think airlines are run by business people more so than in the past. But as we look at sort of the industry and the margins, I mean, we've got Wall Street analysts here, and you guys are smart, and you're great at sort of understanding the macro trends. At Alaska, what we do is we just say we've got to be better than the other airlines. If, if, if the way I would go through that is we've got to be safer. We've got to operate more on time. There has to be more preference. If we're in the marketplace selling uh, loyalty, our credit card, the Alaska mileage plan, there's got to be more preference for our product. We're uh, impressed with the uh, JetBlue, uh, JetBlue folks, but we need to keep winning the J.D. Power Awards. Our fares actually need to be lower. I mean, that's uh, to the Wall Street crowd that, that but that, that's, if you actually want preference, we, we need to be able to offer lower fares. For that to work, we need to have a lower cost structure. We need to have a better balance sheet. So if, if we have those things, we'll sort of, you know, it's the old joke about you don't, don't have to outrun the bear, you just got to outrun the other guy that's running from the bear. That, that's, how we, that's how we look at the business. I do, I do think the industry is going to be better. I think margins for all of us in the trough are going to be positive, but uh, I'll leave it to you guys to quantify where that, where that is. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. Okay. Thank, thanks all very Will much. You, I'm going to keep you up for oh. one minute.